Um, hi, uh, this is Atti, and uh, hopefully we're slightly... I, I <laughs> am slightly more prepared this time for uh, for uh, this video. Uh, clearly not, since I'm spacing out already. Anyways, I've got my... Um, I've got my cup of water this time, because I was getting so dehydrated last time. I've got this little webcam situation and hopefully more controllable lighting in my bedroom. And um, it'll be a little bit weird to remember to look into the camera when the screen that's showing me feedback of what I'm doing right now is over here on my laptop. But, oh, we got a stack of books. Okay, so I'm thinking of dividing this... Um, uh, show into segments based on, let's see, what are my segments? Uh, first of all, the books that I read uh, in the past week or, you know, finished in the past week um, that I didn't finish. That sounds like a, that doesn't make sense. But basically the, the books that I, that I, you know, like read some of, but like didn't complete. So like, you know, books I'm not entirely qualified to review. Then moving on to the books that I didn't like as much, then the ones that I felt more neutral on, and then slowly, you know, like, better and better up until the ones that I loved. Um, this week, uh, I have nothing as enthusiastic that I was as enthusiastic about um, as Brindabar last week, but um, but there's still some cool stuff. So uh, let's see what I got in. This is mostly from my library haul from last week. The first book, however, that I actually didn't finish, uh, I got earlier in the summer, um, and appropriately enough, it's the summer book um, by Tuva Janssen. Does that does that autofocus? That is autofocus. Does autofocus back on me? Okay, it does. Nice. Um, so uh, I I'm a huge uh, Tuva Janssen fan, and I um, you know because of Moomin Troll, but I only ever read Moomin Troll stuff. So I got this book, and I was really excited about it because it's like you know it's for um, it's more for grown-ups, but at the same time, it's still Tuvi Janssen, and so I trusted her to be, you know, like, amazing and, like, unique and, you know, bring, like, a, like, a, like, slice-of-life flavor that, that felt, like, you know, respectful of the uniqueness of each life that there could be a slice of, and, and I expected a lot of humor, and, you know, judging by the back of the book, it says that kind of thing here, you know, uh, what does it say? Yeah, the, so the, Philip Pullman on the back. I mean, I, you know, I, I was a crazy, uh, His Dark Materials kid as a young, like, when I was, like, 11 or so, and actually still. Uh, and he says, uh, Tove Jansson was a genius. This is a marvelous, beautiful, wise novel, which is also very funny. So I was looking forward to that. Um, so I, I read, I started reading this in the summer, and, um, I, it was, like, right before the, the smoke hit, uh, my city. And so I was, uh, out, uh, kind of in the nature nearby my house, just kind of like sitting in the tall grass and reading this book in the summer breeze with the wind rustling in the trees around me. I was, I thought like, you know, beautiful. I had my little sun hat on. I felt really cute. Uh, and then <laughs> it was hard to keep reading it. Um, it's a book about um, like a granddaughter and grandmother, uh, like having little adventures on a small vacation island um, in Vinland. And um, it's not funny. And I was really surprised by that because, uh, I have a pretty particular sense of humor and Tuva is one of the only authors who has ever captured my sense of humor. I find the Moomin Troll books uproariously funny. Um, this one I just didn't. Uh, it's, it's still, uh, it's still cute. It's still quaint. It's still, you know, has like a rustic charm to it, but, uh, it didn't make me laugh. Um, in fact, it felt kind of dry to me, kind of boring. So I gave it another shot later in the summer, uh, or, or sorry, later in the fall. And, uh, oh, hey, little, little spider buddy. Spider on my bed, sorry. And um, I just wasn't able to get into it, so I didn't end up finishing it. I, I, I don't want to force myself to read books that I'm not super enjoying. Um, the illustrations are beautiful. Um, here's one example of that. If it'll focus, I don't know how to get this camera to focus. Uh, you can't really see that. Anyways, um, it's the illustrations by two of us, so of course they're beautiful. Um, interestingly, she made the choice to have it so that um, none, oh, so none of the um, human characters ever have their faces shown in the illustrations. It's not focusing, um, but you get the idea. Um, if you're a fan of Tuva's art, this is great. But uh, there's none of her cartoony faces. I guess maybe she's going for a more serious tone because it's it's the same style that I would expect from uh, all of her other artwork. But yeah, no no faces, uh, interestingly. So, um, I guess that's my review of that. Uh, I would say 
that if you are a huge Tuva fan, of course, give it a shot. If you are specifically looking for funny slice of life, childhood summer stories, um, I would say if you want that, maybe go for the uh, the Gerald Durrell books, My Family and Other Animals, and Birds, Beasts, and Relatives. Those, I think, are kind of what I was expecting from this. I was kind of expecting like a Tuva, Birds, Beasts, and Relatives, whereas like, you know, it, Misadventures of a Quirky Family, you know, uh, like enjoying summer on a island in Europe. <laughs> um, but that isn't quite what I got here, because it wasn't nearly as funny as Gerald Durrell is, or as Tuva usually is. Uh, that was a long review for just that. Anyways, uh, moving on to the books that I wasn't um, the biggest fan of. Now, uh, I pretty much all the books that I got from the library this uh, week were um, pretty middle of the road for me. Um, so I don't have, like I was saying earlier, I don't have a lot of ones that I feel super strongly um, like I super loved, and I don't have any books that I uh, super disliked either. The ones that are on the bottom of this list uh, are more like just lower tier neutral, honestly, um, for pretty nitpicky reasons. So I'll just get into that. Storytelling, storytelling of Ravens is my uh, bottom choice this time. Um, the illustrations are, you know, cute enough. They're just little drawings of animals. There's no particular story. Every page is just a separate scene. Like this one says, the business of ferrets had an important deal to discuss if Gerald would just finish up at the water cooler. And every page is like that with a different group of animals. And the point of the book is just, it, you know, it says here, Inspired by the surprising and idiosyncratic names for groups of animals, author Kyle Lukoff and illustrator Natalie Nelson have created a picture book full of clever wordplay and delightful visual punchlines. Um, so it's, it's that's the thing. It's, it's just like these little scenes that showcase um, the quirky names for groups of animals. Part of my problem with this book is that it doesn't have uh, any particular hook uh, that is interesting to me in terms of storytelling. Um, uh, but my... Uh, another problem is uh, this book is very idiosyncratic of me, I think, but it's that um, I uh, so I used to be really like mystified by these uh, these like words for groups storytelling of ravens business of ferrets these words for groups of animals I was really mystified as to why they were so poetic um, and uh, so I looked into it and I found out that um, that the reality of it is is that these are you know, these aren't like agreed upon names or, you know, they aren't ag agreed upon words by groups of people who, you know, would be like somehow more qualified to name them, which I, I don't think it needs to be. It's also not, you know, they're, they're not like terms that kind of like grew out of colloquialism. They're not like, you know, like, like, like words like herd and flock. I think that just like comes out of the language. Um, most of those poetic ones, they're literally just like one poet who decided to be weird one day, like one poet that decided to be weird one day and named it that. And then everybody acts like that's the official name for it. And they're like, wow, it's so crazy how these official names for uh, for these animal groups are, are so poetic. But it's just like when it's just one poet who came up with it, to me, that's like, you know, you could do that and you would be exactly as qualified calling that animal group that um, you could come up with any word that you want. Um, and so... And, and which you should, and I think that's fun. And I still love the idea of like these poetic names for groups of animals. But um, I, I guess I just, once I learned about how most of these poetic animal group names um, got their start as just like, you know, just one guy, you know, deciding on a poetic word pretty arbitrarily. And then nobody ever actually uses that word to refer to a group of animals. It's just that every now and then somebody harps up that, that someone did and acts like it's some sort of universal term. Um, to me, that feels like a weird amount of like credence to give to uh, these poetic terms um, in a way that uh, like cuts people off from the reality of what's going on, which is that anybody could come up with a term that poetic if they wanted to and be just as valid. And there's no like, you know, these aren't like common in use phrases uh, in some way that would really you know give them real meaning you know what i mean nobody's really using the word business of ferrets every day or storytelling of ravens every day we're gonna say if we're gonna say a flock of ravens if i see a group of ravens i'm gonna say a flock of ravens and that's the that to me is like you know actually in language in use the real word for these things um so to be like oh like this is 
to, to, just, to make a statement so hard is like, that's what a group of ravens is called. It's like, no, that's what one guy called a group of ravens. And I feel like it's misleading to say otherwise. And, and, uh, and, and, and also like, you know, makes people think that like, oh, like group of ravens has been named. But it's like, if, if you, hey, if you like poetic names for ravens and you want to come up with your own, you have just as much a right to do that as whoever called it a storytelling. That's a big ramble. Probably repeated myself in there. It doesn't really matter. I'm not very articulate today, but I'm really just going to let myself be whoever I am today. I have, it's a 3, 3 p.m. I'm getting a slow start. Um, anyways, this happened to tap into a little pet peeve of mine that I don't think I properly articulated, but whatever. Look into it yourself, form your own opinion. Uh, okay, my next book is Empty Fridge by, uh, I'm going to say, Gaten Doramus. Um, it's probably very American <laughs> sounding way to pronounce that. Uh, cover is a board book. The The book's shape itself is interesting. I like books that do that. Um, kind of like a interesting way of building this book. Um, it's about, a, you know, somebody at the bottom floor of, a, of an apartment building who doesn't have enough food, so they go floor by floor up their apartment building looking for ingredients um, from their... Uh, neighbors to see if they can cook something together and all of their neighbors have empty fridges except for one ingredient and they end up making something together um this book was fine but i guess it just felt a little bit um like It's hard to put my finger on what it is. It it it, it was fine. I, it, it's lower on my list today because it just felt a little bit forced. The writing just felt a little bit forced to me. Um, the uh, I, it's hard to explain why. Um, there's just like a lot of extra asides I felt in the writing that felt like they were just the author trying to figure out what to say. In my personal opinion. Um, and, and I'm not saying that that's actually what's going on, but it just felt that way. The, um, the, the conclusion to the story felt very foregone, like, uh, you know, like the ingredients that they collect very clearly build up to one single, uh, thing that they could have made with those things. And they have all the exact ingredients for that one thing. So it felt very like, like, <laughs> you know, like they were just building up to quiche. <laughs> <laughs> and to me, that's like, I don't know, just kind of boring. You know, there's no surprises. It's just like, it's just, it's just basically like an elaborate list of ingredients for quiche. Um, and then bizarrely in the end, uh, it actually starts to get briefly interesting and surreal, like two pages before it ends. And then suddenly, um, it, it pull. it's a picture book that pulls, uh, it was all a dream. And, you know, I'm, I'm gonna, even though that's not as like heavy, uh, like, it's, like, who cares? Big deal. It pulled that in a picture book. Like, it's a picture book. Who really cares? But, you know what? Honestly, I hate that trope so much in any fiction, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna give, demote this one a little bit just for that, even if it is a picture book where it doesn't really matter. Don't say it was all a dream in the end. Come on. Okay, next one is The Denim Jungle. This one has um, a really interesting story. It's uh, by Angela Taylor Highland and illustrated by Precious Beast. Um, although it says in the end specifically, uh, it's... Illust it's illustrated by Jackie Phillips of Precious Beast. I don't know what Precious Beast is, but personally I feel like it should have said Jackie Phillips on the cover if that's the individual who illustrated it. Um, illustrations are fine. Uh, it's kind of like a, a wacko collage style um, with a lot of different textures. Um, it's not my personal thing, but uh, at least it's, you know, at least it's kind of unique. Let's see, where are we? Um, the story itself, like the like the actual story that you can read, is is whatever to me. It's just kind of a poem. Um, I guess it's fine. It just didn't do that much for me. That's all. Um, but the story behind it is really interesting. It says, once upon a time, a little boy, my husband Ryan, told his mom that he felt he was living in a denim jungle surrounded by jean-clad legs towering above. His mom, Sue, held on to this idea for 30 years, convinced that the denim jungle would make a memorable kids book with a sweet message for adults, too. Months after my first child was born, Sue lost her long, valiant battle with breast cancer. Before she left, she entrusted her denim jungle dream to me, her daughter-in-law, the writer. So, that's cool. Um, it's short. Um, it's just a description of a kid, um, like, of walking through a city street from the perspective of a kid where, you know, like, everything towers above you, even the other people, and, uh, seeing the details that are on your eye level, um, 
don't have much to say about it. It was all right. Okay, um, I think this one's called Lion Lion. It, it looked like it was just called Lion, but no, it's, it's Lion Lion um, by Miriam Bush, illustrated by Larry Day. Um, and choo -choo 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 -choo. Um, it's fine. This this is a story that's got a little bit of a twist at the end. Um, it's got uh, the storytelling um, technique that I quite like, where a lot of the text is just um, you know dialogue. Where it says, what are you doing? And that's all it says. It doesn't say the lion said or anything like that. It's, uh, it's just, it's really tied in with the pictures, which I think like if you're making a picture book, like that's a good thing to do. So um, I like that about it. Um, it's just kind of like, um, not a lot really happens. I, I don't know. It's uh, the, 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 this lion is looking for lunch and the kid is looking for something called lion, but apparently this isn't the lion that they're looking for. And um, the kid keeps on offering different lunches to the lion and each one involves some sort of animal and um, the lion uses a bunch of different adjectives and maybe that's the point of the book is to teach kids adjectives, which I'm not particularly big on like books teaching anything. <laughs> um, uh, anyways, the lion, you know, comically gets more and more covered in annoying other animals um, that are associated with the adjectives that he's describing. Um, and in the end, there's like a, you know, surprise, a, a, you know, kind of predictable, but whatever, surprise ending uh, where the boy finds lion. Um, uh, so it was fine. Um, the, the drawings are cute and um, kind of just uh, didn't particularly do that much for me, but um, I thought it was fine. I think maybe that's a book that would probably entertain some of my students, but but it uh, wasn't quite enough for me. Okay, um, I keep on skipping this. I got this uh, quite a while ago now, actually. I just keep on not reviewing it because I kind of don't want to get into it. <laughs> um, it's called My Dad Thinks I'm a Boy? Question mark, exclamation mark, by Sophie LaBelle, um, who, you know, of course, first thing I had to check is, uh, is she trans? And yes, she is. Um, she's a French-Canadian trans cartoonist and public speaker based in Finland, um, which is great. And, um, you know, basically my review of this book is I am so glad that it exists and I wouldn't put it on my personal bookshelf. Um, not for any particularly, you know, I, there's, there's nothing I have to say. Oh yeah, I guess we're into my neutral books at this point. Uh, I think that started with Denim Jungle is when we started with my neutral books. I didn't say that, but, um, but basically I, I, we need more of this kind of book. And part of the reason that we need more of this kind of book that is books about being trans from the perspective of children is um, because uh, because like we need a book like that that appeals to like a variety of people. So far all of the books that I've found that are kind of like this all kind of have the same sort of bent to them, have the same sort of aesthetic to them for some reason. And and I haven't read that many. I, honestly, this is probably the second I've read. Um, and one of the exciting things about this book is, and I thank goodness for this, is that they have a whole section of the back where they recommend other books um, that I should probably check out. Are You a Boy or Are You a Girl by Sarah Savage um, about being a non-binary kid. Who Are You? The Kid's Guide to Gender Identity um, by Brooke pesson Weddy. Uh, and Phoenix Goes to School by Michelle and Phoenix Finch. And Phoenix Goes to School is the one that looked interesting to me. I'll definitely be searching for that and trying to check that out for the library and hopefully review it soon. But, um, but yeah, uh, these, um, basically just what I'm saying is that, is that I want a wider variety of books about being trans for kids just for the, for, for one, for the sake of having, you know, like, more books representing people like me, but also um, for the sake of, you know, it, the, the more the more variety of books like this there are, the more variety of people it'll appeal to, and the more likely there'll be one that really appeals to me. This one is, it's so great that it exists, just didn't appeal to me personally, um, partially aesthetically, partially um, from the writing, but like not, not like it was bad, it just wasn't like, it wasn't like, it didn't speak to my soul, it didn't excite me, and that's totally fine. I'm really glad this book exists. Um, it's a book about a young trans girl, seven years old, who um, uh, is having a little bit of a conflict with her dad because her dad is kind of upset that she's a trans girl and wants her to be a boy. And um, uh, it's got some humor in it. Uh, I think the best thing I can say about this book that I really liked is that it doesn't, it, it, it is very much about, uh, you know, 
the kid being trans, but it's not just about that. Um, they definitely like take time to go into, you know, fleshing out the kid character as like a person, which is really important. Um, and like going into like, these are her interests and she's a unique person and she's, you know, she doesn't necessarily ascribe to everything being super girly or everything super boyish. Like kids are just kids and they have their interests and it's sort of separate from gender and that's really important. And this book does make that point um, pretty much right off the bat and um, and like for the first uh, for the first like three four pages for the first three pages it, it, it establishes that um, narrative which I think is really important and then there are some resources in the back for talking about um, gender to kids which is great that it's not like secretly targeted to adults and talking about adults about how to talk to kids about this it's like talking to kids about this um, you know, I just, um, okay, so, um, I, let's see, where's my, I'm, I'm going to try and find another book that I own. Um, if you're interested in this kind of thing, where is this book? It's so thin and it doesn't have, um, it doesn't have like a, the title on the spine. So it's always hard for me to find it. I really should have found it before, um, I started filming, but I didn't. Here it is. Um, here's another book I have. It's called It's Okay to Sparkle by, um, by Avery Jackson. And, um, uh, the great thing about this book, although it's, I, I can't remember if it's easy to find. I think it's easy. I think you can find it on Amazon. Um, the great thing about this book is that it is written. It's, it's, it's another book about, you know, being a trans uh, girl and being a child trans girl. And it's you know, about another seven year old. Um, this one is actually written by... The girl in question. It's an autobiography. Uh, it's written by Avery Jackson, um, who, like, you know, was like I think nine when this book was written, or seven when this book was written, something like that. So this one is this one I believe is written like probably from it, quite possibly from her own perspective, but like as an adult looking back, this one's great because it's uh, written like from the perspective of a kid not looking back. Like it's actually written by a child. Um, I got to meet her, and uh, this is my signed copy, one of my signed books. Um, so I'm happy about that. Um, so yeah, if you, if you are interested in this kind of book, um, check out this book, check the other books that are in the back of this. Also check out this because it wasn't in the back of this. Um, but you can see kind of what I mean so far. Like these kind of have a similar vibe to me and I, I just want like, I just want a wider variety of, um, of vibes. I'm not saying this is a bad vibe. I just want more variety in vibes for this sort of book. Um, um, and so I'm not going to speak too much about the, you know, authenticity of this because what would be the point? It's obvious. It's obviously authentic. I think there's a, when, you know, when when a trans woman reviews a book about being trans, I think that in my mind there's like somewhat of a, um, there's there's like a temptation to to be like, well, did it do the job? You know, um, there's I I can't question that because you know every every trans experience is different, and this is written by a trans girl, so. Yes, it does the job. Uh, cool. Um, but I'm personally not going to buy that one for my collection. Definitely going to check out the books in the back, though. Okay, moving on. we got so many books, and uh, we have so much time because we're going so slow. Um, Little Doctor and the Fearless Beast is my next one on here. Um, let's see. When are we getting into the ones that I really liked? Um, okay, we're not, quite, we're not quite there yet. I think that starts with... Yeah. Okay. So this is still in my neutrals. Um, when this book started out, I really wanted this. This is Little Doctor and the Fearless Beast by Sophie Gilmore. I was really starting to be excited about this. I wasn't too sure what to expect from the cover. Um, it looked like it had like really creative, um, clearly something wild was going on in this book. Um, but the art style didn't like personally speak to me that much. Um, but then it, it starts out like this. Um, there once lived a child the crocodiles called Little Doctor. Not the Little Doctor, just Little Doctor. <laughs> the creatures came from all around to see her, and Little Doctor treated each one with care. As she worked, she admired their tough armor and large, powerful jaws. Okay, so as this started out, I got really excited. I thought, this sounds lovely. This is like the this is the kind of kid's book I want, where it's like slice of life in a sort of magically surreal, like, or not magically surreal, like surreal slash magical realism vibe kind of setting um and then as it went um and this is really nitpicky of me but as it went it just had a little bit of um 
it 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 kind of felt like it wavered around. I, I'm somebody who kind of um, I I appreciate a book being um, I, I can definitely really appreciate a book being poetic um, and uh, and kind of having flowery language and having kind of like extra language. Um, but I, I feel like when I when I want that, what I want is I, I want that language to be being used in a story that's that's focused on that, that's focused on the use of that flowery language, that's focused on kind of um, it's like setting scenes and creating moods and where that's kind of the point. Um, personally speaking, if a, if a book is trying to like tell a story um, and it's like a short format like this, like a like a picture book is, um, I, I, I observe this like kind of awkward thing that happens where um, books will kind of like swap sentences where they'll go like, like they, they'll move the story along with these sentences that are very like, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then they'll pepper in these sort of like sudden like, and this isn't particularly relevant to the story, but here's some flowery language to, you know, jazz it up. And it feels very like segmented. It doesn't feel like they're incorporated all the time. Um, and and I am left feeling like maybe you could have just said these like, and then this happened uh, story beat moments like in a slightly more poetic way. Um, or maybe you could focus entirely on the poetic and not particularly feel focused on story beats. Um, I think a really good example of that is um, uh, Ruth Krauss books where like, I don't know if I, I would call them poetic, but they're very much about the, the, there's they very obviously have this unique language to them and lots of superfluous details, but they're also not trying to tell a story. You know what I mean? And those are some of my favorite kids books of all time. Those Ruth Krauss books. Oh my God. Like, um, open house for butterflies and, uh, and, uh, you know, the other ones look them up and, um, I have them over there. <laughs> I can go grab them if they want, but you weren't actually here. So I'm not going to, um, but what I don't like is, uh, is this sort of like compartmentalized, like, story beat, story beat being really to the point sentences where things are happening and then like extra superfluous language. Um, I end up with that just feeling like, well, you know, maybe just, you know, like look to where the wild things are and just have it be story beats, just get to the point. You know what I mean? Like, like just be succinct about it. Um, this story by the middle of it, I was definitely feeling that there it, it's, it's got this sort of like stilted, uh, rhythm to me where there's like thing happens, thing happens. And then like superfluous, you know, like, pretty language kind of moments. Um, it's not like, it's not overwhelming, but it was, it was enough to make me feel like so close, so close. This could have been a really amazing book. And I think if it, if it didn't have like a premise that got me really excited, I probably wouldn't even care. But the, the fact that it had a premise that got me really excited and then didn't quite hit the mark, uh, made it like more of a disappointment to me, but I'm um, still cool enough pre premise that I put it in my neutrals and not my negatives. Um, okay. This one's called Holy Moly by Lois Ehlert. I'm going to pronounce that name that way. Um, this book has one die cut <laughs> that has, uh, been ripped at, by my, whoever the patrons of my library are. Um, the main draw for this book, I think, is the art. It's, uh, it's like a crinkled, like a crumpled paper, um, like abstract shape collage. Like these are all supposed to be like earthworms and stuff. And that's what they look like. And everything's, you know, all, all the art is like photographs of uh, heavily textured, different colored papers layered onto them, each other, or like um, actual, actual popsicle sticks to represent like the popsicle sticks in the garden. Um, it's got some decent rhymes with a decent, decent rhythm. I, I like the layout of these like giant letters, uh, like these giant letters that really fill up the extra space on the page a lot. I, I think that that big chunky style has its place and this is one of them. Um, I like how bold and kind of, uh, uh, what does this, what does this remind you of? What's that book? Um, uh, what's that book about, uh, all of the numbers and letters or whatever crawling up into a tree? Um, I'm sure if, if you teach preschool, you know, the one uh, that I'm talking about, I, it's, it's got a name like clip clap boom or something, but I can't freaking remember it right now. And I really should be able to, cause it's a super famous book. Um, but, but anyways, that one, you know, what is that called? Um, Nope, can't do it. Uh, that sucks. Um, anyways, it's a story about an earthworm going through the earth. Um, I, not much of a story here, uh, just kind of a fun, you know, well-paced rhyme. Um, I think that the thing that puts this uh, where it is in, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't like a super moving book, but I think the thing that pushes it over into 
like a book that I was really interested in uh, enough to put it this high in my neutrals is that it's got this section at the back that talks about all of the bug species that it uh, featured. And they, I, I really love the like combination of how abstract, especially the uh, over here, over here, how abstract the potato bugs are, but and, and the earthworms, but then like the scientific description of like here are the here are the creatures that we featured and they're you know there's stuff like tomato hornworms and um, and sphinx moths that like you know not everybody's heard of all the time and so that's cool broccoli worm look at that cute little broccoli worm I love that um, so that's really fun and uh, and then and then the the end pages here have a map a labeled map of mole's home so uh it's definitely got like a really fun uh, jaunty visual style and um and, and really unique in that way i don't see that much uh paper cut stuff um so i i thought it was good uh it just you know there's not much of a story it's just a mole going through the earth kind of showcasing the different things along the way that it runs into um not much of a story it's just a mole living mole life uh, so you know uh, this one's called Pezzatino by Leo Leone. I'm a huge Leo Leone fan. Uh, there's a bunch of his books on the back here. Specifically, I think An Extraordinary Egg is one that everybody should read. Really fun book to read to kids, Extraordinary Egg, because um, in Extraordinary Egg, uh, these frogs find a chicken egg and then it hatches into a crocodile. It turns out it wasn't a chicken egg. Or, of course, it was a crocodile. But the frogs continue to say, like, oh, it's a chicken and you know all the kids who are who you're reading this to like can tell it's a crocodile so every time you every time that the story calls it a chicken all the kids get to be like no it's a crocodile and that's really fun and uh makes that really entertaining uh fish is fish is a really great one um i like that one i got it from the library earlier this year um and i recommend that uh what else swimmy is uh one of my favorites and actually i think the only one that i currently own in my permanent personal collection um, and there's tons of other ones here that I have either read and feel just neutral about or actually haven't read yet. I, I, the biggest house in the world, I haven't read that, so I'm excited about that. Anyways, Pezzatino. Um, this one gave me distant flashbacks to The Missing Piece by Shel Silverstein. I haven't read that since I was a kid, so I don't know if that's an accurate comparison. Um, the art in this is way more compelling than uh, Missing Piece, but the story is essentially the same. Um, this little piece Pezzatino. Uh, man, it's like hard for me to tell what's going on here. Okay, this little piece Pezzatino is um, looking for, you know, who, which larger creature uh, he's a piece of, and he runs into all these pieces. The best thing about this book is, um, so he runs into all these animals that have pieces and ask them, like, am I a piece of you, you know? The best thing about this world is that the, is how abstract this world is and how it just kind of like um, accepts it just it just kind of asks you to accept the reality of this world where you know it, it's okay so like there's kind of different species that it runs into and in a, in, a, in a normal like folktale which is this kind of has folktale vibes in a normal folktale this would be like the elephant the mouse the lion whatever but instead it's um it's these things and not only are they like abstract in image but they're also abstract in the way that they're described so this one is just called the one who runs and that's all and it's very kind of like ominous to me but also like fun and it, it feels like like you know mild fantasy world building in uh in a kid's book this is uh this is the strong one this is uh the swimming one swimming one of what like they don't say they're just these peace things and uh meanwhile there's this gorgeous like what is that like oil um like oil uh isn't that how they do that like oil spill photography it's like water and oil mixing that makes that kind of uh look i think i kind of a psychedelic vintage vibe to it um and other cool textures in the landscapes um but yeah I, my favorite thing is i just love any kind of like introduction of strange creatures and world building and the sort of casual way in this in which this book introduces these uh very strange surreal creatures um and just kind of uh acts like you know instead of like defining them or explaining them too much it just kind of introduces them and lets you accept that this is how the world works is that there's all of these ones this is the one on the mountain and uh one of what it doesn't explain a, and i i love that it creates this uh real atmosphere to me and um fun to see like really creative uh world building um in a, in like a low-key subtle just a few pages picture book kind of way um i want more of that because, you know, that's the great thing about picture books is that they are short and they, they do oftentimes just kind of like assume that you 
know everything uh, that you need to know for this book. There's usually not any kind of, uh, there's usually not any kind of like setup, like explaining what things are um, in the beginning of a, of a picture book the way that there might be for um, a longer book, right? And so I think a lot of authors will just kind of fall back on like, well, therefore I'm going to include things that, uh, or not therefore, but you know, put that aside. There's just, you know, most picture books just by merit of like, you know, the way that stories are written, uh, use things that we do actually have a, that kind of like we come to the story with that understanding of what that thing is kind of knowledge um and so it's cool when a when a book like decides to like like you know have that same thing with a kid's book where it's it's a picture book we're not going to like spend a chunk of the story explaining how the world works um but we are going to set it in a surreal world with things that aren't familiar and just still have like you know it's, it's written for kids uh, in another universe where that is what the animals look like is the vibe and that's the kind of world building i like in general so i like it in a kid's book um okay this one's called taffy time um i'm pretty neutral on this one again the art is like cute but honestly my honestly i'm not a huge fan of it uh my favorite thing about it is probably the color i think the color is really nice again it's got it's got that pink teal combo or like this, in this case it's more like light blue but it's got that pink teal combo that i kind of complimented um last week and actually some yellow in it too so maybe i just really love that color combo um it's um it's a pretty basic story about you know just like a, a little sister kind of feeling relatively inadequate and trying to find a way that she can help um uh her dad and her older sister when you know she's a little kid and she feels like she can't be as helpful um and like she keeps messing up but then in the end she finds a way that she can help and so that that story is pretty basic and i feel like i've read it before um this one uh puts a little bit extra in there by making it also kind of a like a just through the storytelling kind of showcases um what life is like on a on a maple syrup farm um which is something that i didn't know anything about so it's it's fun that it kind of just incorporates that into it it, it does it doesn't I, i'm glad that it didn't feel the need to be a book about um like about like here's how a maple farm works it just kind of like does demonstrate how maple farm works as it goes through this other story that's more um more of an actual story and more of a human thing um so yeah, uh, it's all right. I thought that was cool enough. Um, I just, you know, didn't part find it particularly super interesting. Okay, um, this one's called Hip Opposites. I actually got this sort of an accident. I don't tend to want to get board books, and this is a board book. Uh, it's not a story at all. It's literally what I should have assumed it was. It's just small, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, small, big, um, it's just a book of opposites, light, heavy. Um, every single page has an opposite pair and illustrates it with a hippo. You don't really need to know much. Um, the reason that this is so high on my book list, even though this is not the kind of book that I usually have particularly interest in because there's no story whatsoever, um, is because there's one part of it that made me laugh so hard. It's going through all these um, different opposites, dotted, striped. Are those opposites? I don't think so. Clear, blurry, that's fine. Invisible, visible, soft, rough. And then it gets to this one, um, right towards the end that's front and side and all throughout the book it's been using this hippo image right um it's been using this hippo image that's like uh this this same hippo image that's on the cover um and so they use that again but then they say uh front side and the front is the main picture of the hippo image that we've been seeing all throughout the book and the and the side is a single thin line um just kind of hilariously to me revealing that the that the hippo is in fact just like a wafer thin like image of a hippo and not an actual representation of a hippo like you know really this should be the side view and the front should just be its face right but like it's not a real hippo it's just it's it's either it's either just an image of a hippo or some sort of bizarre fantasy animal that looks like a hippo from one angle but then is actually like a wafer thin <laughs> slice of something uh this this image with the word side below it um that's my sense of humor and made me laugh so hard um so i had to give this book props for that um is the lighting dim again is it is it is it too dim i'm sorry i'm always looking over here i just like i'm looking over here to at my like visual of what i look like to see if i'm too dim uh i'm gonna keep going with it okay um this one's called my city um, this one has gorgeous, gorgeous art, but it's still technically in my, um, neutral section because, um, it's a wordless book and, um, 
I just like, I, there's wordless books that are cool. Personally, I like books with words and pictures better. Um, uh, but the art is gorgeous. Let me see. Uh, it's got a simplistic, fun, but painted style with lots of texture to it. And the like kid's face is adorable and um, everyone else's face is too. This is my favorite page. Um, and that was cool. Wait, isn't there another book in here that that reminds me of? Um, oh yeah, this was interesting to me. This page exists and then also in uh, Denim Jungle there's a page where it kind of, for me, like gave words. Cause the, I guess these are similar books in the sense that they're, you know, they're stories about kids exploring a city. But, um, but, but uh, because of that, there was this page that gave kind of, that this book gave words to um, this book's picture. And uh, it happened to be that my favorite line from Denim Jungle uh, was kind of corresponded to my favorite image from uh, my city. Uh, so where is it? Um, and puddle windows look right through the ground back to a treetop view. I thought that was a really nice line. Um, definitely the, my favorite line in the book. And um, and I felt like if we'd paired that with this illustration, I probably would fall in love with this book. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's it's nice. I, li I like kids' books that show an urban environment. Um, and uh, this definitely does that. I grew up in inner city, so I kind of uh, like feel close to that. Um, really beautiful. Uh, lots of lots of nice urban details like the like the litter blowing in the wind <laughs> along with the leaves and um, how many people there are and all the traffic and uh, yeah gorgeous gorgeous book definitely check it out if you are a person who likes wordless picture books okay now we're getting into the one two three four five books that I would consider like my positive reviews um, pardon me um, first one is wild um, honestly, that's my head. Um, honestly, uh, this is the lowest on this list just because I have to admit that I'm being a little bit maybe hypocritical with this. Uh, really like 80% of the reason that this book is, uh, this high on my list is because of how much I love the art. Okay. So this is Wild by Emily Hughes and, um, it's about a feral kid and, but you know, of course, a, like feral kid story sounds like inherently, Exciting. Um, I think that's always a fun concept. Uh, I'm interested in it. Uh, there wasn't much of a story here. Um, what would you expect from a story about a feral kid? It's about a kid who's feral and then she gets taken into society and then it doesn't work out in the end. Uh, not a lot that went on. No, no dialogue or anything. Which the book doesn't need to have dialogue for sure. But to me, I don't know. Okay. Um, anyways, uh, the thing is, is that the art is just absolutely. Ad uh, adorable. The, the texture and detail and color is all really, really nice. And, um, and lots of these cool panoramas. But then on top of that, there's this like, sort of like, I would say kind of like Pixar concept art, which, you know, I'm honestly sometimes a sucker for, but this kind of like Pixar concept art kind of cuteness to it, um, with these big eyes and look at that fun, like cutaway into the forest. So I love looking at the pictures of this, not a huge amount of story, but there is some, uh, and it's at least the story that's here is pretty concise. Um, so that's cool. Um, but yeah, just about this adorable, uh, you know, I love the character design of this like adorable green haired girl. Um, who's like the feral kid. I'm having a really hard time with left and right here on this camera. I'm also a little bit, it is, it is dim when I bring the camera in. Can I, uh, it's a little bit more light. Maybe that's okay. I, I guess that's okay. Um, yeah, so I just really love the art style, and she's got little fangs, and she's got green hair, and the character design is really great, and the character design of all the animals, focus please, the character design of all the animals is also awesome, and that's why I love this book. Um, I might actually buy this from a personal collection, honestly, based on pretty much entirely the art alone. Um, okay, this one is Short Stories for Little Monsters by Marie Louise Gay. Um... Honestly, that art style on the cover uh, almost put me off of this book. Uh, you can't really see it because the camera's not focusing. Come on. Ba -da -ba -da -ba -da -da. Um, it kind of reminds me of uh, whoever, who drew Mutts? You know that comic strip, Mutts? Uh, it kind of reminds me of that, that really like kind of like thin lines and, and messiness and it's, and like, you know, like lots of different colors. To me, not really my style. I don't love the art in this book. But um, it ended up being really, really charming to me and really unexpected. And I, when is this book written? 
It came out 2017 and I was actually really surprised because it really gave me a vibe that reminded me of books that um, would come out in the 90s that I would like find and used um, in used bookstores in my neighborhoods. And um, it, let's see if I can describe why. Um, it really is just, okay, so it's more of a graphic novel, honestly. It's more of a graphic novel for kids. There's like panels and and uh, all the dialogue is is in word bubbles and that's kind of takes the place of any uh like written text it's all it's all handwritten um dialogue uh that is written text but you know what i'm saying it's all it's all it's all handwritten dialogue in word bubbles so it's more of a graphic novel um it's these like basically like one spread stories um that are just kind of settings and um it's just very like scattered and and like this it just really feels like the author riffing um let's see if i can find a good one um, okay, this one's this one was kind of fun. These two kids talking. Do you think worms know that we exist? Of course they do. We are their masters. You're right. Without us, they would be nothing. Yes, we control their minds and their bodies. They have to obey us. Worm, I command you to wriggle. You see? He wriggled. Worm, do not move an inch. He's not moving. Worm, I command you to fly. Fly, worm, fly. He's not flying. This is boring. Let's go. Worms rule the world. You know, just kind of like... It's just kind of like the author riffing, and I can't explain why exactly I like that. I, I guess I, I do like when, um, like, oh, it's not focusing on me. I do like when, um, like, comics for kids are not super focused on trying to be funny, but are just kind of, like, focused on trying to be weird. I wish my camera would focus. That's really annoying. Maybe I can't use this camera. If you can't focus, then I can't use the camera. Hello? What do I got to do? Beep, 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 Refocus. Refocus on me. There we go. Um, but yeah, that, you, you, you know, like there was just this kind of vibe when I was a kid in the 90s that was just kind of like everything was zany. Everything was like a little bit, you know, just like off kilter, but it was also kind of like down to earth. Like it wasn't trying to like, it, it, I mean, a lot of it was like trying to like be like gross and anti-authoritarian. But at the same time, there was a lot of stuff that was just like, you know, like, uh, like Bill Nye the Science Guy is an example of this. Just like, you know, we're just we're just having fun and we're being goofy and we're being weird and and we're also being a little bit sarcastic and you know we're also being a little bit uh, like wry humor and um, and um, just kind of being in, in in that way sort of like appealing to the appealing to the adults in the room as well as the kids but in the process kind of to some extent treating the kids in the room with a bit of adult respect I felt and and uh, and that's that's a lot of like big rhetoric for this silly little book but I felt like it did that. Um, the 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 short stories in this never feel like they are trying to make a point. They never feel like they're trying to teach a lesson. They're just being there and being kind of entertaining. And I think I would have loved this book as a kid, um, even if I wouldn't have loved the art, just because it's kind of like it's it feels like a book for weird kids. Um, it doesn't feel like a book that started with a concept. It feels you know a lot of books like feel like they're a book that started with a concept and then they try really hard to to hit that concept and it just kind of like feels too overworked to me. This one feels loose and free and I love that. Um, this one is uh, Cherry and Chira by Kaya Doi. This is part of a big series. I have, um, I'm in the process of getting the rest of the series on hold at the library. I think I'll be getting two of them uh, on today's run to the library and uh, I only have this one. I think it's the first one since it's just called Cherry and Chira and the other ones have kind of a subtitle to them. Um, this one is another one that honestly a huge part of why I like this is the art. The art is stunning to me. Um, absolutely beautiful. Uh, it's translated from Japanese. Uh, the story is really simplistic. Uh, but there's two things that I love about this book. Okay, well, first of all, I'll address the story. The story is really simplistic, but, um, but I do appreciate it more than I like the story of Wild because it's, um, it just kind of feels more actually slice of life like wild is trying to tell this like overarching story in this really simplistic way and i like how simplistic it is but at the same time this overarching story itself isn't particularly compelling because it rushes through a kind of predictable concept this one is very very slice of life and i think slice of life uh can be basic and it still completely fulfills its purpose because slice of life is basic right um so the two things i love about this book are one the um the art is absolutely gorgeous. The softness of it is amazing. The the character designs and the characters' faces are amazing. The colors are obviously 
uh, super gorgeous, and we've got these really great animal designs. Um, can you focus on that, please? Where, like, I don't know, that just kind of creative, like, stretchy, like, doesn't feel like a default way of drawing a fox, but but that's how they chose to draw a fox, and I think that's really great. Um, but then there's this other thing that's a really, that's a really particular thing that I'm a sucker for, which is that um, the kids go around, in, like this, these two girls going around through the forest and meeting animals who are selling them food. So there's these foods that just like, that, sorry, there's these pages that just show the foods that they're eating and, um, and just has like, you know, like food art. And uh, as uh, I can't, ex I, I would have to ramble for a really long time to explain to people who didn't know me why that's so up my alley. But I just really specifically, I am obsessed with little drawings of items. Um, and this book really delivers. There's all these pages where it's just like these examples of, uh, just like here's the foods that they ate and they're really beautifully drawn and they're labeled with what they are. Bear buys a mulberry jam sandwich on honey bread. The rabbit has carrot buns with lemon jam. This is important to me. Um, and it does that several times throughout the story uh, or a couple of times throughout the story and it's enough for me. Um, and that paired with this gorgeous art, can I get this image to be focused on? How do I, there, can you focus on that? Beautiful character design. Um, I, I love this. Really excited to read the rest of the story. Sometimes with, um, can you focus on me again? Sometimes with a uh, series, I kind of get worried that it'll be a situation where the, like the first book was a success. And so the other ones kind of, um, uh, are just kind of like cash grabs after that. Like they just kind of feel like they're repeating, trying to repeat the success. Um, that's not always the case, but sometimes it feels like that. I, I prefer a series if it was conceived as a series, of course. And um, I don't know how this one will be, but because the story is so simplistic and because the art is the main thing that I like about it, um, I just kind of do want to see more of it. And I think that the sequels will be interesting to me. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and also who knows, sequel culture might be totally different in Japan. Um, or people know, but I don't know. Uh, this one's called My Mastodon. This is um, another historical, like historically inspired book about the, uh, well, who are they? Um, My Mastodon is a fictional story inspired by a unique American family, the Peels of Philadelphia, uh, who lived in the Philadelphia Museum. And it's like one of the earliest or maybe the first like natural history museum in the United States. Um, and it's about them digging up the bones of a mammoth and, um, and then uh, the child, the, the young girl, um, who's like four years old at the time of this, um, and that's historically accurate, historically accurate apparently, um, gets really attached to the mammoth and doesn't want it to leave on an exhibition. Um, there's some really pretty art in this. It's a really calming, uh, gentle story. Um, this is one of my favorites, this image of her like sitting underneath the mammoth bones. Um, um, it's a very, like, it has kind of a somber tone. This obviously isn't going to be a funny book. Um, it's not like a silly book. It's not a fun book. Uh, but it's, it's, its tone is calm. I think it's well written. Um, it, uh, it does a good job at doing the thing where it's like very to the point. Every word feels like it's, um, needs to be there. But at the same time, it, uh, has a certain amount of whimsy to it based on the fact that it's, you know, kind of like written from a child's perspective. Um, and I think that that keeps it, with this kind of like it, it keeps the story flowing it keeps the it, it, it doesn't feel like the author's trying too hard um but at the same time uh it does have like color to it and life to it and interest to it that uh, i think really helps um and i i just i just liked it i like these these gentle books from a child's perspective that tell a really um unique and uh and like adventurous feeling and yet slice of life little tale about like what it's like to be a kid in all the unique situations that a kid might find themselves in. And this is definitely a unique situation for a kid to find herself in, but it was still felt relatable because you can imagine how you would feel as a child in that situation, I guess. Um, anyways, uh, the last one this is my last book. Sorry, this has taken so long. It's an hour long. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, this one's Stephen and the Beetle. This is, this is, I mean, I'm, this is a book about a kid learning to respect a bug, and that's a that's a issue that I care a lot about. So it was uh, important for me. This is an art style that I wouldn't have expected to like that much, but I was surprised. I really liked it a lot. Um, this is probably going to be weird, but uh, this book visually reminded me a lot of um, of the book Life Doesn't Frighten Me at All, which is a Maya Angelou poem. That's um, that in lieu of illustrations, uh, there's basically they just chose um, Basquiat paintings to be 
uh, the illustrations for that book. So I guess what I'm saying is that the illustrations in this picture book remind me of Basquiat. Um, and I guess that's a little bit weird to say, but uh, I'm going to, I guess, stand by it. There's just such a variety of textures and so much uh, like empty white space and such uh, like dynamic um, differences in like the way that each illustration is rendered that um, that it reminded me of, of Basquiat a little bit. Uh, there's all sorts of different mediums mixing together here. Uh, page to page it feels really different. There's parts where the illustration of the bug is like cut out of paper and pasted onto another illustration rather than being drawn directly into it. Um, and this talk about stories that get to the point. Uh, this kid is about to squish a bug. He decides not to squish the bug and then he looks at the bug and appreciates its um, you know, like the fact that it's a living thing. And um, this, come on, like, does that not look kind of Basquiat-esque to you? <laughs> this is him imagining that the bug is a big triceratops, which is probably my favorite moment in there. He basically just realized how cool the bug is. And then, you know, he lets the bug go on its way. And there's this nice ending line where the bug does go on its way. And it kind of like gives you this sense that Although it's completely inconse inconsequential to humans, um, whatever the bug is doing is important to that bug, which is a nice thought, you know? Um, so it's, it's really short, and I thought it was beautiful, and I, I, I definitely, I honestly don't know if I'm going to buy this for my collection, so maybe that should have been um, lower on my list, but I want to definitely buy this uh, Stephen and the Beetle by, uh, I'm going to say Jorge Lujan. Lujan? How do you pronounce a J? in a Spanish name. I think it's Jorge Lujan and uh, Chiara, Chiara? Car? Carer? Sorry, I'm bad at names. Um, Cherry and Chira by Kaya Doi and probably Wild by Emily Hughes I'll put on my wish list for my personal permanent collection. Um, those are the books that I got this week. Uh, okay, um, I, I don't know, that, that video is way longer than last week, but I'm really letting myself be who I'm gonna be this week because it's been a chill, slow start of a day. Um, because it's been a stressful week. Um, so I'm um, gonna close this and uh, go off to the library to get another haul. I think I've got even more books this week, so it'll probably be an even longer uh, video next week, um, but I'll see you then, and uh, slowly, hopefully, I'll start getting an idea of what I want this channel to actually end up as. Okay, see ya. Uh, how to turn this off. Just got back from the library. Here's my haul from this week, and I'll review them next week. See ya.